in the field with the Messina straight field trip. So Marcello will present a slightly different view of a uh, well-known time dominated delta. Thank you Marcello. Yeah, thank you Domenico. It was a lot of fun in the field. Uh, so now uh, it's time for a presentation which is probably a slightly different angle as Domenico said uh, about uh, the talking about high dominated ancient rocks or in this case specifically deltas. Uh, first of all I would like to thank my co-author uh, Daniel Collins and James Nicatcher that helped me with this with this presentation and work that we submitted to, to a journal. I'm not going to spend too much time on this uh, slide because it has been discussed a lot but it, it is very important to understand that understanding the process of uh, that control the position of your rocks is not just simply giving the name to the rocks by dominated that influence, but it has a lot, a lot of implications. All, all your morphology will change. Any applied reasons you need those rocks for, any reconstruction you want to do later on is based on that interpretation you make. So it's not a minor aspect. It's, it's, for me, it's the main one. It's the key. We start from there. And I tried to summarize this in, uh, in uh, this picture from, from my PhD thesis, where you see that there are several morphologies and fashions depending on tidal versus fluvial uh, dominance or processes. So keeping this in mind, uh, let me say I spent most of the time studying tides. I went to the Mekong, many other tidal areas, and I, I really enjoyed it. But when I have to make the interpretation of the ancient, this is where the problem starts. Uh, and I think our criteria, maybe they are not, they are not very strong for interpreting uh, type of the succession. And uh, I discussed this during my PhD thesis in Argentina, uh, 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 Jurassic rocks from Argentina, and I wanted to test this even further, and I went to the most famous uh, location for type of the rocks, in my opinion. So I went to the book links. This is the Seco Samson and the Bak Tong, uh, where are the upper predations of the Western Interior Seaway, uh, I would say these are the mecca of, uh, of tidal dominated deltas. Uh, I would estimate hundreds of, maybe half of us has been there, hundreds of uh, uh, geoscientists every year go there for training. Uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of, people, of geoscientists have all been there. And uh, when you look at these rocks, uh, you see these uh, bundles, these heterolytic patterns, many indications of tides where uh, people have interpreted uh, this type of environment based on. So th there are many open debates about surfaces, if there are uh, sequence boundaries, if they are not, but there is a huge agreement, maybe the, the best agreement I know that these are type dominated systems. You look at all papers published through time on this formation and there is a variability if these are barrier lagoons, deltas, estuaries, combination of these, but always, always, always no discussion that these were type dominated systems. So I went there to several locations with my colleagues and we started to look at these fashions and uh, overall, I'm just going to present a few localities, not all of them, but overall we see this nice worsening of the train, so we generally agree this is a delta front uh, system uh, with some channels on the top, distributed channels, but then when you look at these features in detail, we see, yes, there are hydrolytic beddings, Asymmetric ripples, mudstone drapes, all these features, but they're not completely across the deposits, they're not distributed everywhere. They're usually within these heterolytic beds, which I indicated here in blue, here and, and here, but then there are other beds which are more sandstone dominated, they don't have any evidence of marine influence, tides or waves or trace fossils. And, uh, and they are unidirectional in cross certification toward the sea, and uh, they are completely different. So, what is this interpreting pattern? Why we have not discussed it so far? You go in more, uh, as you can see from the log and from other photos, it's, it's the widespread across the entire, uh, the entire upper almost. Uh, you go to a little bit more distal location, you start to have more wave reworking, especially at the top of these beds, but again, you have this preserved very nice interbed of decimeter scale in interbeds like 10, 20, 30 centimeters and we need an explanation for this. We cannot just look at the features in between these beds with a lot of zoom and ignore what is this interbedding pattern. 
So uh, with a little help from uh, Mark Liggins in uh, ethnology, we looked a little bit at the trace fossils in, in these beds, and actually uh, the pattern is not only in the sedimentary features, but also in the ethnology. Because you see that actually there are beds which are highly biodegraded, or more biodegraded if you want, which are these ones and, and this one, for, for example. And then there are these other beds which are unbiodegraded, or eventually you get some top-down burrows, but this is not uh, uh, associated to the deposition of that bed. It's a post-event, top-down uh, uh, biodegradation. So again, we have periods of a marine environment, possibly, or, or British border or marine, I'm not sure, uh, and periods which are different. You can see here an example, uh, top down Arena Polaris uh, on this bed, which is unreverberated, so the reverberation is actually at this interval and, and going down, but during the deposition of the bed, we are looking at something uh, different. Uh, again, this is a more distal location. Uh, more vibrated, but again, there are beds which are entirely non vibrated like the sun, the sandstone, or even sometimes even some of the mudstones are not uh, are not vibrated. So we are looking at these at two different energies, uh, two different energy levels, and we need to explain how these energy levels are, are uh, varying. And this is not entirely new. Uh, we've been uh, discussing this in other papers myself. What the Lincoln has discussed them and many, many others. And uh, we've recognized this uh, bed in, in many other rock formations. We've recognized them in um, modern systems. Uh, it's not very clear from these radiographs, but there are these beddings interpreted. And uh, it's, uh, there is a huge agreement that these uh, beddings are dead. Decimeter scale are not uh, the typical tidal rhythmites, they are very difficult to explain with uh, tidal processes. But uh, we are looking at something which is a seasonal pattern of a river, as also Janine showed in the, in the uh, inclined stratification. So during the high discharge of the river, we will make a, a, a stronger uh, contribution of sand and a stronger fluvial input. And then during the interflat phase, where the river is not strong, we will have uh, uh, more action for for working. So it is a pattern which we've been des described a bit everywhere, and now I'm reporting it from, from the Seagull Sandstone as well. Is it in one locality of the Seagull Sandstone, or is it everywhere? I, I, I would say, generally speaking, it's everywhere. I mean, there might be an area where it is not, but we've been at many localities. Uh, I cannot show the details of the difference of all of these different localities. The bedding is the dominant. For me, it's the number one sedimentary structure in this, uh, in this rock formation and is undescribed yet. Uh, other localities from other published literature, for example, these deposits were in the past interval as a barrier lagoon system. But I can see that there is this very nice bedding here, which is very difficult to explain with the barrier lagoon models without the input of the fluvial system uh, at the seismic scale. For example, what would happen if the tides are very strong or the waves are very strong? I know at least three examples from the Holocene where uh, we poured, in two cases is our project, one is an extent and another group, there has been pouring of a uh, wave or tide or together uh, tide and wave dominated systems. So I report you one of these examples. This is the Mekong River Delta and it has one channel that was abandoned. 700 years ago, the story of this abandonment, I think it's very interesting. Maybe I can share my paper later for people who are interested. But the point is not, uh, I'm not going to focus on why this channel was abandoned at the moment. Uh, it was abandoned and filled. We took cores, and we know when the abandonment occurred. So if you want to know how an abandonment feel of, of a tidal dominated system look like, it looks like the top. It's a pile of mud. The theoretic part is when the channel was active, so prior to 700 years ago, and the, the sediment is entirely homogenized by the tidal currents. You don't see this pattern, it's very difficult. And I think it's logic, because the, the, there are tides every day in the systems, and uh, even this is a seasonal system, it's monsoonal, this uh, pattern is at a uh, longer time scale and it's not preserved, because tides are active in the water. 
So I came up with this model where on, on your left you, you have uh, this very nice river signature preserved, uh, made by this interpreting. It's a signature which is very common in the rock record and somehow we, we miss it. And uh, on the other side, imagine that you have deposits which are entirely rewarded by waves or tides. Let's forget for a moment if this is sand or, 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 or mud. Uh, the, the idea is that it's entirely reward by, by, by wave or, or tidal energy. And then you have a series of um, in-between situations. And I think in the Sea of Sandstone and in the Baton, we are actually in a mixed, mixed energy situation, but much closer to, to the the side where the river signature is actually very nicely preserved. The tides and the waves are reworking the top of the flatbeds for a few centimeters. This is not impressive compared to other systems. A, a last remark I want to make is about the um, this signature that maybe you can recognize in two different systems and that it is the same signature or very similar but it gives you two different uh, uh, points of view, two different models. The first signature was reported by other colleagues in the uh, McMurray Formation, and you see this flat in the flat, uh, so these flat beds with, uh, let's say, seasonal pattern in general terms. And this is from the Seagull Sandstone. I think they're very similar in, in, in many ways, but there, there is a key difference. In, in the McMurray Formation, these waves were recognized in point bars. Point bars that potentially formed quite upstream in the system. So I'm not surprised is if, as you move downstream, you get more tide-dominated systems. So you can get potentially a tide-dominated uh, estuary or, or a tide-dominated mouth. This is not preserved, so we cannot double check that. But I wouldn't be surprised if this signature uh, here would go downstream to a tide-dominated signature. But in the sequel. We are looking at this signature, which is strongly fluvial control at the delta front. So potentially, it is, we're talking about very weak tidal reworking. It's not able to rework the, this fluvial derived interbedding, not even at the delta front, where tides are strong, supposedly. So I'm not expecting that these tides would go that much farther upstream, but I, I would think there is a short through the two marine transition zone uh, compared to, for example, the McMurray formation. So, same part, same bedding, but the, also the location where you, are, you find this bedding could have uh, important implications. And there is the, I'm suggesting this reinterpretation of the Sea of Sandstone after four decades as, as uh, mixed energy but fully dominated. But maybe you say, okay, what about the other uh, features at the sedimentological scale that we can? find in this formation? Do they support the tides or the fluvial interpretation? I would say that actually they, would, they always supported the fluvial interpretation. If you look at the interbedding, sorry, the bundle of the seagull, they're, they're usually not mudstone drapes, they are made of organic material. And this kind of drapes, this is a, a, a modern fluvial system, there are no tides here. You can, you can produce bundles in modern fluvial systems because this is just the dynamics of the dunes which is able to produce that. We don't want to accept it because we want the diagnostic feature, we want uh, to infer tides, but uh, the reality is that uh, the bundle, uh, as all other indicators of tides, are, not, are never diagnostic themselves. Uh, this is a plume experiment with unidirectional flow and uh, they reproduce the bundle as well. Then there is a second problem. The second problem is that uh, actually the seagull by at least two different authors was uh, associated as an analog to the Mekong River Delta. I worked in the Mekong River Delta, you take samples from, from these systems, actually they are very heterolytic. These are, are samples from the channels of the Mekong, uh, tight dominated part, and there is a high, high proportion of mud, all this brown here is mud. And uh, there is a well-known reason for that, that tight dominated deltas are able to re-import and retain mud in the system. This is well known. So if you want to interpret a sandstone as the dominated delta, you need to explain why this process was not active, why uh, it, it was uh, in a different way. And finally, there has been numerical modeling of the Western Interior Seaway. And actually, usually, in the location where the Seagull sandstone formed, which is around here, 
these models suggest that tides are very weak. They cannot move more than a month. And uh, usually we say, okay, maybe there was a local constraint or something, but what if simply it wasn't that tidal and, and the rocks are, have this evidence and we are, uh, we are not seeing them? So this is my presentation and uh, my suggestion is maybe that uh, compared to what we say uh, today in other presentation, maybe we do not have a good understanding of ancient tidal lights. I think actually our criteria for interpreting them are, are very loose and uh, perhaps we should try to, to, to look at more of the complexity of these systems and all the indications we can get as the moon and not at the tidal indicators, uh, which could be instead the finger. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcello, for this uh, really interesting talk. Before I ask the first question, I would like to be sure we have a good lawyer with you. Are you ready to with a good lawyer? So, now, a couple more questions. because they match with what I've seen in several other places. Um, I'm old enough to have gotten, began my career at a time when we could barely recognize tidal deposits because visitor and tidal bundles had not been published. Now we've come to the point where anyone finds anything that looks like a tidal indicator and it's suddenly a tide dominator or maybe strongly tide influenced environment. I'm afraid to say that I think tidal influence has been overemphasized and the type of approach you've taken is exactly what's needed, that detailed look at the sedimentology to see where temporally these tides are being recorded. Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure if there was a question or so, but uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Yep. <coughs> so, is your uh, Mekong example, do, do you see any uh, systemic changes in terms of our excavation between the layers you interpreted as a kind of product of signals? Yeah, the, that, that's very interesting, and it, it is also one of the reasons that drove us to, to take this course. We took this course because we already had the crab samples and we, uh, we had an idea of the, the dynamics in the system, but we, were, we were wanted to know what would happen in a stratigraphy. And uh, this is a unique example, it's the only abundant channel of the Mekong Delta. And we took two long cores and uh, other five short cores, and uh, there was no pattern. And, uh, it, to me, it looked very homogenized, always like this. You, you find beds a bit sandier locally, but not in an organized manner. And also, by the vision, uh, I don't see an organization. I, I didn't see an organization. We had also collaboration with the um, well, former Simon Fraser University colleague, now it's in New Zealand, he helped us. We concluded this was entirely homogenized, or more almost entirely homogenized by the tides. Okay, very good question, Sergio. Very but just because you are one of the, I, I was, I was wondering uh, uh, about the reason that you mentioned about why this channel was abandoned. But uh, anyway, no, my comment was about the homogenizing to layers. Uh, did you have considered the possibility of collapses of the margins of this channel, so producing? massive, unorganized intercalation like this, instead to attribute this to reworking of tides. In, in all seven cores, for me, it's a bit difficult to explain. And uh, uh, this year, that, or last year, there was a paper from the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Brown and Ale, uh, 2021, I think, and they concluded the same. Like the core, I mean, it's a monsoonal system, it's a seasonal system, the uh, core is homogenized by tides. We took a core in mid of Vietnam, it's a wave dominated mountainous system, again, we're in a monsoonal climate, what we got was a pile of hammocky or, or a pile of uh, 
sand uh, homogenized by, by the waves. So for me, the diagram I showed that marine processes re reward completely the eventual interpreting for me, it, it's, uh, it, it makes sense. And uh, I think it's from three or some examples. Thank you very much. So it was the last talk of the day. Thank you. Okay, so our uh, next speaker is Milovan, who speaks from Nazarbayev University.